All right, can I have your attention, please? Welcome to the Fort Kent Senior Center and also to this class, um, Senior College class. Um, and uh, tonight it's a very special class, actually. It's one that we all heard about. The topic is familiar to all of us, and we even use it in our in our language, but we know nothing about it. And uh, tonight we're going to be uh, having a presentation on the Aroostook County Jail. And it's uh, the jail falls underneath the county commissioners here in Aroostook County. I mean, we have a county government, and the and the jail falls under county government. And Ryan Kelsey is uh, the instructor tonight, is also the commissioner. I mean, he oversees county government. Ryan was born in St. Francis, and he was educated in the school system here in Fort Kent. He went to the University of Maine at Fort Kent, and I remember him. Um, <laughs> uh, he, in, a, in a good sense, he was such an advocate for students and programs. That was, that was noticeable, and clubs. Yeah, very much so. but, uh, he graduated with, uh, with a degree in business management and one in political science. And he continued. He went out, uh, went out to Vermont and uh, Norwich University and completed a master's degree in uh, uh, public administration. Ryan then went to work in county government, actually in municipal government. And he was a town manager in St. Agatha in uh, Wallagrass. And, uh, Eventually landed in Madawaska, who was town manager in Madawaska. So he comes, uh, comes with a lot of municipal type of experience. In 2017, I think, he was elected to the, uh, not elected, he was appointed to the county, uh, to Mercy County Commissioners. And he's the chief administrator. And he oversees the jails. Ryan? One quick correction, because I have to do that to you, Don. I, uh, <laughs> I work for the county commissioners. I, oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, there's three elected county commissioners uh, up here in this area, Norm Fournier from Wallagrass, uh, Paul Underwood from Presque Isle, and Bill Dobbins from Holton. And so they act kind of like a city council or a town council, and they hire a manager or an administrator in my case. And that's what I do. But... Um, I'm excited to be here tonight. I, I had done a class, was it last year or the year before? We did it on Zoom, I know that. Mm. And it was, uh, you remember Liz, how long ago that was? It's two years. Two years. Mm -hmm. And I just did an overview on county government, so when I was asked to do something specific on the jail, I, I have never done one on just the jail, so it's going to be, I'm going to hopefully learn something too as we go through this. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about um, our current and future needs. I want to explain to you what the situation is right now at the at the jail and what we'd like to see it become in the next I'm going to be cautiously optimistic and say five years but it's probably going to be a little longer than five years for this to actually come together but anyway we'll, uh, we'll get through it so Don inserted a bunch of pictures in my PowerPoint presentation so I just am seeing them for the first time tonight so I'm going to have to be uh, paying attention here a little bit too uh, this is just a sign. In my PowerPoint presentation, there's a typo. I, I put 1850s when the jail was originally built. Um, county government was, Arista County was form, formed in 1839. So I'm not really sure what they did until, uh, until 1889 uh, with prisoners in Arista <laughs> County. But uh, knowing the history, they probably were just kept in cells in local, uh, local uh, places. I know like in Madawaska, where I worked for a couple of years in the basement of that town office, the, the upstairs where the superintendent's offices used to be a municipal court. Um, and in the basement, there were holding cells. So crime has changed quite a bit. Um, and people incarcerated certainly have much different issues than they did in the 1800s. This next shot is what the jail looked like um, quite some time ago. Um, and this is a more modern day view. And what you're looking at here, and it's probably better in this next slide, that's actually a house that is built attached to the jail. And it, I did explain it in the, in the uh, slides later, but up until the mid-1970s, 
the sheriff, whoever the sheriff was, actually took residence at the jail. So he lived in this house. I'm saying he because it's always been a, a male sheriff in Arista County. But he lived there in the house with his family. His kids were raised there, right attached to the jail. Um, the previous sheriff was Daryl Crandall. And Daryl's father, Daryl Sr., was the last sheriff to live here. Daryl remembers as a child playing in the stairs and in this house when, when he was growing up. So today that's no longer. Um, sheriffs, you know, have their own house and, um, and we've repurposed that to office space. Have any of you ever been inside the jail? Nobody wants to admit that, but, um, but sometimes you can go for tours and things like that. So. Um, our jail is a little different than what you might imagine. This is more of a common area where some day programs might be taking place or meeting with a counselor or things like that. Uh, but the Arista County Jail is a three-story facility and it's built dormitory style. So unless someone has, you know, either going to harm themselves or something like that when they come in, um, they're going to be in general population with about maybe 12 or 13 other inmates at a time in a dormitory room. Uh, we do have solitary confinement, if you will, that's individualized, but again, that's only when someone is, you know, suicidal or something like that. They'll be isolated and monitored uh, differently. But for the most part, this is what a dorm kind of looks like. You can't see the whole picture here, but bunk beds, uh, a common table, a television screen, and a bathroom. And that's going to be shared by, like I said, 12 or 13 inmates. Males obviously are separated from females. In one room? Yeah, twelve in a row. It's it's a pretty good size room. It's it's not as big as in here, uh, but it's probably like one quarter the size of this room uh, would be the sleeping area and where the television is. What's, and the, what's the capacity of the whole jail? <laughs> so I'll, I will get to that, but it, it's a our we're, our license is for 117 inmates. And so that's where we're going to go now is into some jail facts. Like I said, I I miss commented here, it wasn't the 1850s, it was 1889 that the current jail was built. There was a modernization project, uh, I guess, uh, in the 1950s, and then there was a pretty substantial remodeling in the 1980s, and it was in the 1980s when, the last time when the jail was, there was a committee put together and a uh, decision was made then not to build a new jail, but to remodel and add some space in the existing facility. Um, that is when we went to the license number of 117. Prior to that, I think the jail was only licensed for about 60 inmates. Uh, as of this morning, uh, or as, as of yesterday morning, I guess when I put this slide in, we had 121 in-house, so we're a little over capacity. Um, just because there's just no room for all of them. Um, and we have actually 21 inmates who are in Arusta County custody who are boarded out to other facilities because we don't have the space anymore. And we've been pretty consistent on that 20 to 30 uh, number boarded out for almost a year now. Uh, I was telling Don earlier, during COVID, it was amazing how the judges and the defense lawyers quickly came to resolution on cases and emptied the jail. We were down to about 60 uh, for that period during the pandemic. It was really nice for the guards uh, and people had a little you know, breathing room and more space. But as soon as the pandemic ended and people started committing crimes again, that number goes right back up. And, um, and that's that's the reality of it. Um, what's what's the uh, females versus male in this? Yeah, we have approximately uh, two dozen females and the rest are males. So about 24 females. And what we did with this boarding out situation is we're boarding all of the females out. So they're all in York County right now. Wow, York. In yeah. York County? York County. Because all the jails in Maine pretty much have the same problem we do. They're all overcrowded. They're all maxed out. Uh, Cumberland County would be probably where we would send them because they do have capacity bed-wise, but their workforce is so down. They're 80 guards short right now, so they have closed an entire wing of their jail. And so they can't take any borders. In Cumberland, uh, because of their proximity to the airport, they also were at one point housing federal prisoners, so people that have committed federal crimes. There is, you ever watch the movie Con Air? 
Yeah. It really is a con air. <laughs> it has flag prisoners all over the country every day. And Cumberland was getting a lot of those federal prisoners and they can't anymore because they're maxed out on space. But they pay really well, so it helps lower the budget of the county, the county that's housing them. Um, the other thing that a lot of people don't know is there's 147 individuals in Aristic County walking among us that probably should be in jail. Uh, they've committed crimes that would put them there. But they are, you know, not repeat offenders. They may have done one thing or whatever, and so a judge makes this decision and says, okay, jails are full, can't put them in jail. We're going to put an ankle monitor on them, um, and they're going to be under community supervision. And we have three community supervision caseworkers in Arista County, one right here in Fort Kent, uh, Billy Joe, uh, Karen? Yes. Uh, was a Lavasser. She is one of those caseworkers, and so they each monitor those 147 people. They have a caseload. They meet with them every week. They have to do drug testing every week. They have to report in every week. Uh, if they have a job, they have to make sure they're showing up to work. All are you on Road? I don't know where they. <laughs> no, no, I honestly don't know where they all live. To be honest with you, uh, I know that Billy Joe. I can tell you that Billy Joe takes care of the St. John Valley two caribou, and her caseload is about half of that 147. Is this pub public record? Of who it is? Is it public record, open to the public? Not who it is, no. 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 Not that I'm, I'm not sure, Jack. I don't think so. I mean, I've never seen a list of who they are. And, and, and do they have work uh, eligibility? And yes, those people can be working. But they have to wear that ankle monitor so they know where they are at all times. The truth is, a lot of people that are incarcerated or are in a situation like that are not working. Because. Uh, huh? Because. I don't know. Because people will hire them because of? Mm, no, not necessarily. They're probably addicted to drugs or have, okay. you know, another situation. Yeah. Um, the other side of the jail, that people, you know, people think jail means prisoners, but there, are, there is a workforce there. Um, it's obviously a 24-7, 365-day facility. It's always open. Um, we have 42 full-time employees in the jail. That includes the jail administrator, some support staff, and the correction employees, the guards themselves. Uh, like I said, the jail is always open. Uh, local arresting agencies, so your local police departments, uh, the state police, and the Border Patrol, who have arresting uh, ability, are responsible for the transportation of those prisoners, of those inmates to the jail when they're arrested. So, the sheriff's office doesn't provide a taxi service. Uh, <laughs> they, so used huh? they used to come up through, and that was a nice thing that Jim Adore did, <laughs> but it was not. it's not a statutory requirement in the law. So uh, Sheriff Crandall eliminated that, that bus service, if you will, um, and now what they do is they will come as far as Caribou one or two days a week. So if Fort Kent and Madawaska don't want to drive to Holton, and there is room at the Caribou Holding Facility, which is in the Caribou PD. Our sheriff's transport van will pick up prisoners. But, you know, I, like he said, I worked in the town offices quite a bit. Hardly any of them ever go to Caribou because they want to just get that prisoner to jail and be done with it because there's a lot of paperwork and processing when you go halfway and then have to be picked back up. Uh, but, yeah, that bus, I think that van was coming up to the valley every day. Yeah. And picking up whoever was arrested the night before. <laughs> uh, is there a time limit that you can spend in the county jail? There is, if you're sentenced. If, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But if you are a sentence, if you have gone to court and you have been convicted and you were sentenced for your crime, the county jail will not be the place for you if your sentence is more than nine months. If your sentence is more than nine months, you're going to state prison. State, State prison. prison. Where's that? Warren. That means you've committed a, a more serious crime that would fall into you know a different felony bracket. <clears throat> the jail is the most expensive part of our operation. The county budget, all told, is about fifteen million dollars. Another two million to provide services in the unorganized territories. That's a separate budget that we're responsible for. The jail budget alone this year is 5.2 million, um, and of that amount, the good old state of Maine contributes 1.6 million, and 
your local property taxes and fund the rest. So when you get your tax bill from your town, they're supposed to put on there how much is municipal, how much is school, how much is county. And county taxes on average is about five to seven percent of whatever your tax bill is. And, um, and we, we assess the municipalities, the county tax, based on their state valuation, and that's how the money is received to us. That 1.6 million uh, is actually pretty good from a statewide perspective. Statewide, the average is about 20% of the cost of jails is paid for by the state. And this is an ongoing battle between county governments in Maine and the state of Maine. Um, Norm, uh, who I mentioned earlier, is on the board of directors of the Maine County Commissioners Association. And they meet once a month as a committee, and they meet once a week as a legislative committee. Um, and the majority of their conversations are on jail funding because it's such an expensive piece and how you run a jail and, and the mandates that come with a jail are all dictated by the state. So the feeling mm -hmm. has always been the state wants all of these certain regulations and rules in place, they should be paying more of the share. So far the state has won. <laughs> Although I will say in the last biennial budget uh, there was some deal making that went on um, and the governor's budget did include an extra $2 million. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it gave our county anyway, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars more towards the budget than we had received in prior years. So we're happy about that, but it was a one-time thing and the fight continues to try to keep the funding going. Um, our costs, so <clears throat> when you take what it costs to incarcerate an individual in Aroostook County, it's about $36,000 is what it costs. Um, and that's a little bit higher, as you can see, than the national average of 33000 Because it's cold up here? <laughs> that does play a part in it, I won't lie. I mean, our budget last year for heating fuel was through the roof like everybody else's. Um, and we saw some, some pretty crazy, crazy budgets uh, for that. There are other driving costs. Uh, actually, I think I got the next slide that says that. Obviously, the personnel is, is the biggest cost. We have about $3.4 million of wages, benefits, and overtime to fund those 40-some positions in the jail. Um, one thing a lot of people don't realize is when you become incarcerated, even if you have health insurance, most health insurance policies will not pay when you're in jail. And back to the state and their mandates, mandate that if you're incarcerated and you need health care of any kind, when you're incarcerated, the county must provide that and pay for it. So, if, you know, we were for a long time contracting with Katahdin, um, Katahdin Valley Health Center out of Patton that has offices in Holton. They were our provider for pretty cheap. I mean, they were, I don't know, maybe $300,000 a year to provide that medical care. But if an inmate suffered a heart attack or need a dialysis or anything you can think of and we had to bring them to Bangor or bring them to Portland or wherever, 100% on our dime. Um, Why wouldn't the insurance pay? A lot of them don't have insurance, number one, so okay. just to be clear on that. But if you did have insurance, insurance policies are written that say if you become incarcerated, we're not providing your health insurance. What about Medicare? Nope. And there's a fight right now. <laughs> there's a fight right now in Augusta to ask for a, a waiver from the Medicare program. And there are 14 states that have successfully convinced the feds to provide a waiver. So Maine is trying to get that waiver. Um, but up until right now, no, it doesn't. The only thing is, um, you know how there's like Medicaid rates at hospitals? If we bring a patient to a hot to the hospital, they can't charge us more than what that Medicaid rate is for the state. That is a state law. But it still adds up. Yeah. It still adds up. And so what we decided to do a couple years ago is instead of gambling every year that someone's going to have something serious and we have to pay for it out of pocket, we put out an RFP. We had, I think, two bids <laughs> on companies that actually provide this medical services. And that's what we ended up with, with just about a million dollars. We pay that company, and that company provides the health care in the jail. There's two nurses full-time that work at the jail. Um, a lot of medication in the jail. A lot of medication in the jail. 
So prescriptions used to be about $200,000 in our budget. That's included now in that total one million. There's mental health services that happen in the jail. Um, now it almost seems like it's commonplace, but medically assisted treatment for people that are on, um, on that for like uh, opioid addiction. Um, we resisted for a while on doing that in-house. We didn't want that in the jail. We, so we had a, a, a person who was arrested and was receiving medically assisted treatment. And we said, well, we're gonna transport you to the nearest facility that does that. And even if we have to transport you every day, we're gonna do it there. Why? Because at the time, and maybe it was the wrong way of thinking, there was a concern that that could be contraband in the jails. Believe it or not, there are drugs inside the jails. So we resisted. And what happened? We were sued. We weren't sued by the individual. We were sued by the, a uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. Mm -hmm. They picked up her case and they sued us. And I thought, we're going to win. You know, we're going to risk the county. We're going to end up in a, a situation with either a judge or a jury, whatever. I still to this day don't understand how this happened. But we were told, sorry, you're not going to be, your case is not going to be heard in Aristic County. Your case is going to be heard in neutral territory, and it's going to be important. <laughs> so um, we lost. We lost, and the judge didn't order any settlement. The judge ordered us to mediation. And so our insurance company and us and the ACLU never met the lady that had been in jail. She never was any part of this was uh, horse trading mediation back and forth, and we ended up settling that lawsuit for about $275,000. So guess what? We now provide medically assisted treatment inside the jail. We were the first jail to do that because we were the first jail to be sued, and since then all 60, all 50, there's only 15 jails in Maine, all 15 jails now provide medically assisted treatment inside the jail. Uh, so that's part of that one million. Um, and then food service. We, for the longest time, hired cooks, um, but we couldn't compete with the private sector. Um, we were losing our cooks to the hospital. We were losing our cooks to uh, schools in the area, you know. So we did like a lot of places have done, like university, and we put out a bid to contract food service with uh, an Aramark or a Sodexo type company that does uh, provide food service in the jail. Um, and that's about $500,000 a year to feed all those uh, prisoners. Is the food prepared there? It's prepared inside the jail. Yeah, there's a kitchen in the jail. It's a small kitchen. It's not as big as it should be probably, but it works for um, the... Uh, and then, of course, there's a cost of transporting. So once they're in the jail, they're our responsibility. So like I said earlier, local police departments are responsible to get them to the jail. But those people, once they're in jail, are going to have court appearances, they're going to have doctor's appointments, they're going to have whatever, we have to provide that transportation. And so we have a couple vans that transport prisoners every day, somewhere. <coughs> the jail personnel or the sheriff that does that, who's responsible when the patient, when the prisoner leaves the jail to go to court, who takes it? The correction officers that so there's a transportation unit within the sheriff's office. They are armed guards that, tra that transport prisoners. But the entire jail and the operation is under the sheriff's umbrella. The sheriff is the, in state law, is the chief jailer. Now, over the years, the sheriff has moved away from being the main person and, you know, time has created positions like a jail administrator and a support sergeant and all these other positions within the jail that, deal with it, but the sheriff is still ultimately the final authority. So what are people in jail for? And we have 120 people, well, 140 some people in jail. I don't care if it's petty theft, murder, every crime in this county can be traced right back to the drug epidemic. Period. That's just uh, the last thing I put on here, you know, used to think of mm -hmm. the Holton Hilton is what they called it, right? And there was a lot of OUIs, and people would stay in jail for 48 hours or 72 hours. There's nobody in jail today that has an OUI. Nobody. People still get OUIs, but they don't end up in jail. They get, you know, no, they get sentences that are either uh, 
there's a program in outside of Bangor where they go and they spend their 48 hours there and get you know their counseling treatment whatever but nobody is arrested and brought to jail they might get arrested and brought to jail for that for that one little time period but they're not staying there all the because there's no room all because there's no room <clears throat> And the, and the crimes are so much more serious. Ryan, is that the deep? At the deep program. Yep. What did you say? The deep program. It's called the deep course, oh. and that's the, they go for that right. whatever their sentence was. I think it's forty-eight or seventy-two hours. They actually live right in that facility outside of Bangor. <coughs> uh, and the offenses, people in jail. You know, it's a full range. A lot of domestic violence. A lot of domestic violence. Um, uh, probation violations uh, and that's usually they were out on probation you know they were they, they were on drugs they got clean in jail they went out on probation and they fell off the wagon and they got caught again or they didn't pass their drug test or whatever so they're back in jail because of that and then property theft there's a lot of a lot of stealing going on in the Worcester County but I say it all again goes back to drugs they're stealing to sell to have money to buy drugs and the other thing that a lot of people don't realize is there are very, very few people in jail who are actually sentenced. So going back to your question about how long can they be in jail, about 5% of the people that are in our jail today have gone to court, have been sentenced for you know a week or a month or three months or whatever their sentence is, and they're serving their sentence. All the others are pretrial. So they're sitting in jail because they can't make bail or their crime is too heinous to be let out. I mean, we have people in jail today that are, you know, um, accused of murder. Their court date might not be for another two years or more. It takes forever. Oh, so they can be held for two years yep. because they haven't been sentenced. Yep. Correct. So they, so, and you can't ship them to state. The state Perfect. will not take them until they're sentenced. That's a great question and a great thing that we've argued. If they're charged with murder, yeah, maybe they won't, you know, maybe they won't be convicted of murder, but it's a crime that would end them up in state prison eventually. We feel they should be sitting there waiting. Yeah. But that's not the way it works. They sit in the county where the crime committed until is, they're sentenced. Is that because it's easier to get somebody from Holton to Fort Kent for trial? Or is it because they just they won't take them. They won't take them. Uh, murder trials are all pretty much good. First of all, murder trials are handled directly by the AG's office. They're not handled by the district attorney's office. And secondly, they're all held in Holton. So there wouldn't be a murder trial in Fort Kent. Okay. You know, it would always be it would always be in, in Superior Court in Holton. Maybe in Caribou, because we, you know, that's another thing. We're kind of unique. We have two courthouses. A lot of counties don't. They have one. Uh, but we have two superior courts, uh, one in Caribou, one in Holton. So once in a while, they might do a murder trial in Caribou, especially if there's, you know, if it was a Southern Aroostook murder and there's a lot of people in Holton area that might know, you know, the victim or might know the, uh, the person sent it, the person charged, they'll move it to Caribou. But, uh, so yeah, so about 95% of the people we have in, in jail are just sitting there waiting. And, I don't know if I have it in here, but I'm going to mention it now. A lot years ago, that wasn't like that. You were you were sentenced, and you were serving your sentence. And if you became trustworthy uh, in jail after you know, let's say you had a nine-month sentence, and after a month, the guards say to the sheriff or to the jail administrator, you know, Joe is he's well behaved. He's he's doing really well. I think we could use him in our community services program. And so the sheriff's office used to provide a lot of community service with inmates. They come to towns and they paint fences or they work in the wreck, you know, fields and raking. Or uh, Dixie Shaw, who runs the uh, food bank, she used that program all the time in her gardens, I mean, and they loved it. First of all, the inmate gets out of prison for uh, eight hours, but also the deal was if they worked a full day, they get one day off. Uh, worked two full days, they get one day off their sentence. So it was an incentive for them to. Yeah. To, to do it, and they, get paid? Were working huh? for free. they get paid. They get paid, but it's it's minimum wage. It's not like it's not like a lot, but they do get some money for it. Uh, but a lot. The law says you can't use pretrial people for that. They have to be sentenced, and they have to be <laughs> trusted, and, and they're actually called trustees, is what they're called. 
So the very few that we have, the 5% that we have, we use them, at, they are trustees, but we don't let them out in the public anymore because we need them inside. They do laundry, they help in the kitchen, uh, they do janitorial, whatever. Uh, so we don't have that program right now because we just don't have the bodies to, to make it work. Uh, when Elliot Carter got sentenced to nine months, yes. was that so that he'd go to the state? I, I assume so, Jack, because, I mean, he's definitely not going to be in a county jail facility, I don't believe. Okay. You know? I don't know where he's going to end up, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't, know, I don't know if that's even been determined yet. I don't know, though, if the nine months had anything to do with that or if that was just the deal they, they worked out. Uh, like everything else, you can find anything about government somewhere in the law and for jails. That falls under Title 30A, Part 1. So Title 30A, Jim's familiar with Title 30A, that's, that's the all-encompassing statutes for local government, municipalities, and counties. Everything from roads to town meetings to elections to you name it. Um, and, and in there, Part 1 is the whole section about county government. And within Part 1 is Chapter 13. And Chapter 13 is specifically where it talks about county jails and jailers. And it mentions there that the sheriff is the one responsible, has the full custody and charge of the county jail and all prisoners in the jail. They keep in person or by a deputy as jailer, master, or keeper. Well, we've never called anyone a master or keeper in our jail, but the title is jail administrator. So that person is uh, in, that person is actually a former deputy sheriff himself. He was actually Jim Medore's chief deputy when Jim Medore was sheriff. And when Jim got done as sheriff, he moved over to the jail and has been a jail administrator uh, ever since. And as I mentioned earlier, up until the 70s, the sheriff took residence there at the jail. Um, and now that's been converted to some office space for not, not county services, but like our, our uh, medical provider, the nurses' offices are in that section. There might be some you know, counseling services that other uh, outside agencies like AMHC or someone like that provides. That's where they do that kind of stuff. County jails are only for adults, so there is no youth in any county jail in Maine. So, obviously youth do commit crime from time to time, and they're going to go to a facility regardless of where they're from. Most of them end up at Long Creek, which is in South Portland, um, and I believe there's another one somewhere else in the state where anyone under 18 would serve out their sentence. And persons who are sentenced for nine months or less carry out their, their sentence at the county jail. Um, and if they're longer than nine months, they do end up in war. And so, take for example, last year there was a murder trial. That person had been in jail at, at the county for, I'm going to say, two and a half years. Finally went to trial, was convicted uh, and sentenced. And we immediately, the minute, I mean, the minute that gavel comes down, that person, I don't care what time of day it is, that person's going to be escorted out to our van, and our van is going to drive them directly to war. It's at 10 o'clock at night, that's where they're going. They're not coming back to the, the, the county jail. And again, the pretrial individuals are the ones waiting, and that's the, the majority, 95% of the inmates are pretrial. So why are they not going to jail? To because court? defense lawyers and judges are very, very slow at making things happen. And they're going to tell you that there aren't enough judges, right. and they're going to tell you there aren't enough lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so you heard about this new program that started at UMFK to educate more right. attorneys. That is all because of the overcrowding in county jails, not just our jail, all over. Um, but like I said, when COVID happened and there was no yeah. choice, man oh man, deals got made real quick. And we went from 115 at that time down to 60 in almost a matter of weeks. So. The other thing I should mention is a lot of people that um, are in, in this situation, you know, convicted of a crime, they're not going to be able to afford to hire a private defense attorney. So as you know, everyone's provided an attorney if they can't pay for one. And I think we have, I mean, Toby here in town will pick up a few cases when he has time. 
uh, it's called indigent services, and there's a rate, you know, a, a defense attorney is going to charge maybe 120 bucks an hour normally in Rosta County. I think the indigent rate is like 65 bucks an hour. So not many lawyers are signing up for that. We have one attorney in Rosta County who exclusively does just that service. So he's one person, you know. And, uh, so there's talk now in the legislature to try to increase that compensation to try to make it more um, you know advantageous for private attorneys to take on more cases um, like I mentioned earlier the law does not allow pretrial inmates to be used for our community services pro uh, program so we can't do that anymore outside um, and another funny little fact in the law and uh, this goes back to a lot of county government is you know very antiquated um, counties were formed you know I mean, Think of the sheriff in Nottingham and Robin Hood. That was county, county style government, and so a lot of that has been carried over. And this little quirk in the law is not only do we have to provide food to the inmates when they're in jail, but we have to provide a meal to the guards working in the jail if they so want it. None of them, you know, none of them take it. <laughs> but that was a law that was put in place because back during the Depression, the story goes that guards were stealing food from the inmates to feed themselves so law well, was passed so, so they get fed the guards get fed even if they don't the guards get fed at no cost to them they have the option to eat what the prisoners eat if they want to for at no is cost it that bad? Doesn't doesn't sound too good. nobody nobody I, I, it's it, honestly it's powdered milk is oh. the is the liquid that they're given uh, it's it's not a healthy diet by any stretch of the way. I mean, it meets all the dietary guidelines, but it's not. It's. I think they're making meals for like two dollars and something total. So the food is not. They can't send out for pizza. They can't send out for pizza. <laughs> they do. This company that we work with does what they call spirit lifters. And that was the first time I'd ever heard that term. What is it called? Spirit lifters. And so about six times a year. They prepare a nice meal, like Thanksgiving dinner, or, you know. They, you know, they'll do sit, or they'll do like in July Fourth, they'll do an outside barbecue, hamburgers and hot dogs and things like that. So they do do you know six of those, but other than that, it's mostly a liquefied diet, you know, dehydrated, add water and go from there. Huh. So needless to say, the correction officers aren't too uh, aren't too keen on getting that free they don't go after that, that free lunch. No, they don't go for it. Uh, this next slide, I think, is going to surprise some people because a lot of people don't know that there is a business component to running a jail. And this has really changed over time. I mean, I'm sure prior to the internet, um, I would imagine commissary services were, you know, shaving cream and maybe soap, I don't know. Um, but with the advent of the internet and uh, you know, television, cable television, all these other things, phone service even, uh, Inmates have money. Some of them have money before they are arrested. I mean, they have a savings account somewhere. Or they have family that provides them funding. But anything they want, they have to pay for. So uh, this company that has the contract provides every inmate that wants one an iPad. And they have to pay for that. They have to pay for the iPad. They have to pay for the internet service. They have to and so... Uh, the funds that are collected from those inmates to have that privilege is retained by the county in what's called the inmate benefit account. And we can only we can't use that money we can't use the inmate benefit account to directly reduce taxes. It has to go back to the benefit of the inmate. Well, that's a pretty broad thing, right? So inmates benefit from us transporting them to doctors' appointments. So we'll use some of the inmate benefit monies to buy new vans when they have to be replaced. Um, if we have to replace some security cameras, the security cameras are there for the inmates' benefit, so we pay for that out of that fund. Um, we have a rec recreation yard outside, so if we put a new piece of equipment, you know, weights or whatever, we use the money to buy that. Um, so that's. Thousands and thousands of dollars are generated each year on inmates buying product, buying services. Uh, they are restricted, obviously, on what websites they can go on, <laughs> uh, but uh, but they do. And the other thing is, uh, back to the dorm style, 
every dorm has a flat screen TV. And every inmate is provided headphones. So if they don't want to watch TV, they don't want to listen to TV, they can, you know, they don't have to have the headphones. The headphones are actually there for people that want to watch the TV. And so I, I remember going for a tour one time with the sheriff and he was explaining that to me. And I, I said, yeah, but what if they don't, who decides what show to watch? He said, yeah. the biggest guy in, inside the room, inside the show. <laughs> So that's the history, the, the old jail, the, you know, the situation we're in now. Uh, so where are we going in the future? Are, are cell phones allowed? No. 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 If they want to make a call, they have to make a call on. And you probably, you might have read in the paper, um, we were actually, we got our hands slapped for that. Um, you can record inmate phone calls. Unless it's the attorney. Yeah. The minute you detect it, it's an attorney phone call you're not supposed to stop the recording. And we got caught not doing that a few times. Um, the, the guard on duty didn't pick up on it. The attorneys are supposed to provide us a, a, their phone numbers that automatically go on a do not record list. Mm -hmm. And it's an automatic thing. If the number's in the system, the minute that number's called, it'll stop the recording. So it's not a human that has to do it. But some attorneys either change their phone number or forget that or whatever. And then it becomes the person listening in to make the call, make the decision to stop the recording. We did not on a few cases. And were you fine? We were not fined, but I'm expecting we will be sued <laughs> at okay. some point. So is it the person, that the guard, the corrections officer that's listening, do they listen to one phone all day? If it's, or do they go from you know, I've listened to 30 seconds of this, I'm going to go to a different call. Yeah, so there aren't, that, there aren't, that? There aren't that many calls happening enough to you know, to jump around on calls. Um, so, no, and, and I, I don't think many guards take the time to actually sit there and listen to, you know, Joe talking to his girlfriend about how he misses her and whatever. That's, um, but it is recorded, and it's recorded because if they incriminate themselves, on a phone call, not to their attorney, that's fair deal. Okay. And that can be used in court. So what happens is, those recordings that do happen that are legally recorded, it's not our guard so much that listen to that. It's our guard that has to make the decision to stop recording when our call is being made and you realize but it's not the guards that listen to that, it's uh, the uh, main drug enforcement detectives. They'll come in the jail once a week and they'll just sit there and listen to all calls that are made. Once a week, they do that. About once a week, yeah. Now, there was an article in the news recently about the, the phone company's exorbitant prices that they charge prisoners yeah. because of their captive and uh, very discriminatory. Yeah, that, that, that is an argument that's made often. It's, it's too much. Like I told you, it's thousands of dollars that are generated from phone calls, internet use, all of that. Nobody has stopped it yet, but it probably be, will be an ACLU thing at some point where they say, you know, it has to be reasonable or whatever. I don't know offhand how much it is per call or per, it's by the minute usually. Um, but I would imagine a typical phone call, you know, that lasts 15, 20 minutes is probably going to cost $10, you know, which is over time. It's the companies that are? So there's a, a, a company called Securus, and Securus manages all of that you know, it's like a third-party vendor, if you will. They collect those fees, and then they pay the county that they're in a commission off of whatever, whatever their total is. Yeah. So, what are we, what are we talking about in the future? Um, so, what we, f we feel, we the county, I guess, the county commissioners and the sheriff, uh, feel that it's time to start talking about the need to replace the University County Jail or at least do something to deal with the overcrowding um, and a little, little broader picture bringing real in-house mental health and substance abuse treatment inside the jail. Uh, we feel that that's something that no jail really has done and we feel that we need to do that here. Uh, so back in the fall of 2019, they took the first step of creating this jail commission, they being the county commissioners. Uh, 
we brought the we formed the committee. We went through a process of selecting who was going to be on the committee, and then before we held our first meeting, COVID hit, and everything just kind of tabled. Uh, I mean, you couldn't even get into jail, and so we we waited uh, until this past January. We reestablished this commission. And we've actually started meeting now with this new jail commission. Um, it is an expensive proposition. Our estimate is at least $75 million to build a new jail, uh, to house the number of prisoners and the programs that we want to see inside. How jail. many beds are you talking? About 250. You know, we, 250? Yeah. Is, yeah. And is that uh, realistic? I mean, are, are we that much overcrowded with what we have to go from? No, there would be a little bit of capacity there for the future. Um, but I'm saying that number very uneducated at this point. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, we're not making that decision ourselves. Right. We're working with this group called the National Institute of Corrections, who are going to hopefully come here this summer. What the National Institute of Corrections is a federal agency within the Department of Justice, um, and they specialize in working with counties is one of their things. But they also work with court systems. Um, and so what they're going to do is they issue an RFP to for consultants from around the country to bid on, say, our project. They're going to come into Rusta County. They're going to spend. They're going to spend a lot of time remotely doing stuff, but they're going to come actually on site for about a week, and they're going to host a lot of meetings with law enforcement, with judges, with lawyers, uh, local police or agencies, and then culminate, culminating to eventually a community forum where citizens are invited in to hear what's going on and what they feel is the reason why we have the overcrowding. Crime is definitely a part of it, but we feel more so is the backlog in the court system. Oh, you know, I don't want to blame anybody, but we feel that that's where the, that's where the bottleneck is. How big a backlog is there in the court system? Hundreds and hundreds of cases. Like, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even imagine how much it is. It's, it's bad. It's just really bad. Now the existing building, Yes. can that be added on to that building? There's not enough room? If, are you familiar room? with where it is? No. Okay, so have you, do you know where the courthouse is in Bolton? I don't know. Okay. Is it so, by the post office? Yeah, in yeah. that area. Yeah. I'm so familiar. great big beautiful courthouse, yes. right? And the jail is attached to that on the back side. And There's you, no you literally come out of the jail into a parking lot and then you're right on a, a street. And it's bordered by another street this way and another street this way. Okay. It sets on a posted stamp. There's no room there. Um, so it would definitely be looking at repurposing that building for something else, probably connected to you know, law enforcement, um, and then building a new jail somewhere else. Um, but you know, the first step is getting these, uh, these consultants in here to really drill down into that. And even after they've done their report, that's just the beginning. Um, you know, to design a new jail and uh, go through that whole process is going to take years. Are they, are they looking at the possibility of another building in Holton that so, could be... So we're open to building a new jail somewhere other than Holton. Um, we're open to that. We're open to a lot of things, I guess. Um, I think I have it in here. Let me get through this next slide first. Just so you know, this this is the actual jail commission. You're going to recognize some names up there, I'm sure. Uh, the sheriff is the, uh, the chair of that committee. Um, and we decided to try to get as much, uh, you know, local people that are connected to the system some way. So we obviously asked the state police, uh, the Lieutenant Harris, uh, who's the head of Troop F up here in the county. He sits on there. Matt Cummings, who is a chief in Fort Fairfield. And we tried to do this by geography, so some from the south, some from central, some from the valley. Uh, he was appointed by the Arista Police Chiefs Association. Janet Bradbury, she's the town manager of Blaine. She represent, or she's there for the Arista Municipal Association. Kevin Freeman is a city councilor in Presque Isle. He serves as a local elected official. Carol Terrio from Port Kent, obviously retired police chief, um, also a local elected official. 
Hi, Libby's a retired Border Patrol agent from Cary Plantation, and he's also a member of the County Finance Committee. Uh, Don Demar, the town, former town manager here, uh, serves as the citizen at large on this committee. And then we have one county commissioner, and that's Norm, who serves on the committee. And so the idea is, other than Don, who doesn't really report to any group, these, all these other people update their, you know, their constituencies when they have meetings, so Matt will go back to the police chiefs and explain what's going on. And the idea is to try to build <coughs> momentum, build support. And then we have three primary members of the staff that are going to staff this, myself, Dana Jandro, who's our finance director, and then Brian Jandro, <coughs> who lives here in Fort Kent. Uh, he's the director of facilities and IT. And he, him, Brian and his staff are really the ones responsible for all of the maintenance, all of the updates and upgrades that happen at the existing jail now. All the buildings, the Registry of Deeds building here, but all the county buildings fall under uh, their direction. The jail itself does not provide any of the maintenance that happens inside the jail. It's his department. Mm -hmm. yeah. My question okay. was, is there another building in Holton an existing building? An existing building that they could... I'm not aware. There's so many vacants. Yeah, not... The standards of building... I mean, I mean think about, like, when you're looking at a regional years. school, right? Yeah. The, the the regional school is going to cost $100 million. I mean, it, it's very similar. You're, you're just housing a different population in a school. But, you know, security, all these things. You could not build the jail we have today by the regulations you got to follow today. Uh, the reason we have so many guards is because the rules say you need to have a ratio of so many guards to the number of prisoners in your facility. Because one guard needs to have eyes on at least, I think it's eight prisoners or whatever it is. Um, so these new jails that are built are not built on top of each other. They're built on a plane, um, kind of like, well, Somerset County is the newest jail that was built in Maine and it's probably 15 years old now. And so you walk in and eventually you get to an area where there's a guard stationed and then what that guard is looking at are pods that hold inmates so that one guard sitting there in the middle can see so many <coughs> inmates at a time. Then you continue on and you come to another guard who's looking at another group of inmates and so on and so forth. So it cuts down on the number of employees you actually need. Uh, because they can see more than what it is now. Fixing an old building probably costs as much. Uh, fixing a building, building yeah. probably costs as much. Yeah, that is efficient. Right. Um, there's a couple things, I mean, yeah, so I talked about this. This is that National Institute. This is step one. They're going to come here this summer, meet with our staff, meet with the court system, law enforcement, um, and then a public meeting that where all this will be presented to the public. We're probably going to do that somewhere where we can house a lot of people, but where we can also have Zoom so that people from, you know, if we do it in Caribou, let's say, people from Holton and, and Fort Kent can still attend and be part of it electronically. That's our goal. I mean, they can come in person if they want. But uh, Like I said, they're going to put together a report, but that's just going to lead to, um, now, they and they will recommend the appropriate size. So they're going to tell I, my 250 number could change drastically based on what they ultimately put together. And then step two was what when I first put this commission out together, this was what I wanted as step one. I wanted to go right to hiring a consultant to help us develop an RFP that would help design the facility, but also get it ready for bidding. Um, and I have three bosses who didn't agree with that. And so they said, let's take the free service from the feds first, let them come in and do their thing, then we'll do this after we know. So it just takes a, it's just take a little longer, but it comes down to this, what we've just been talking about, the location. And it's gonna be probably the most contentious political fight mm -hmm. the county has seen in a long time. Uh, Holton does not want to lose their jail, or the jail. They feel it's theirs. Um, but there's a big movement in Central Aristic to get the jail more centrally located in the county. So that Madawaska and Fort Kent won't have so far to drive. Um, you know, the court's there. And then, you know, if we, if we have capacity, 
the sheriff now, and I don't see that changing, um, really feels that we should be looking at getting federal prisoners if we can get that revenue from the feds. So having it next to an airport where Con Air can land would be something we'd want. Prescott or Limestone, it could be at the base. Uh, Frenchville might be a little too small. Uh, and Holton actually still would be able to accommodate that with their airport that they have there. Uh, Holton does have quite an industrial park built around their airport. Um, and I, you know, when this comes down to, I, I'm pretty sure is going to be which community puts together the best package to entice us to say that's where we want to go. Is, are there any regulations about where this jail is located? Like, can it be located near a residential area, or does it have to be? So it would come down to the community that it goes in, where what their zoning would dictate. Mm -hmm. um, I think all of them, though, well, all of them, you know, it's going to probably be Holton or Prescott, Isle, quite frankly. Maybe Caribou, I don't know. Um, Caribou has a nice little airport, I just don't know if it's big enough to handle that kind of track. But regardless, most of these places do have an industrial park or industrial zone where jail would be able to be built. Um, but this next phase is probably going to take at least 18 months to get to that step. Uh, and I can just envision a lot of meetings and a lot of, a lot of uh, dickering. dickering. Um, you know, the other element to this is you do have to think, you know, where it is now, the majority of our workforce lives right there. Uh, we do have, you know, I was telling Don before I started, that the, we do have some people from the valley that work at the jail. They travel to Bolton for their three days or four days that they're on a shift. And we have two from Noanaukit that carpool up and work there. So, you know, if we moved it to Prescott, would we lose all of them? No, but we'd probably lose some. But at the same time, we feel if we build this right, we're, we're going to be able to reduce the number of uh, employees that we will need in the jail mm. for the number of inmates we have today. Um, the, the only... Yep. Does the state plan on putting money in? Because the state has closed you know, one of the child facilities. They've closed the one over by Machias. Uh, you know, and they, they encourage schools to combine. What about counties combining? Yeah, uh, I think that there could be. I, I think there could be part of this studying of what we're looking at that could do that. Penobscot needs a new jail. Um, they're overcrowded worse than we are. Um, now, I would make the argument at that point if they were going to combine with Penobscot, Holton becomes equal distant from Fort Kent to Bangor. I got a feeling that Penobscot is going to say, well, your jail's in Holton and ours is in Bangor, let's meet in Millinocket. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Which would make it further for Fort Kent and Madawaska and Caribou to transport prisoners. But um, I don't know. I mean, that is certainly part of looking at it and trying to figure out if it makes sense to, to share with, with another county. Um, this one is, though, in law. It doesn't matter what you want to build. Under current law, any new county facility, whether that be a courthouse or any anything, has to be built in Holton under the law, Shire Town, right? Unless the voters allow it to be built somewhere else. So we would probably, if let's say we come down to it, we do this big feasibility study and we determine that Prescott is the best place. Before we go and look for money to borrow or bond or anything, the first thing you're going to see on the count on a ballot when you go vote in, in a November election is a question that will say, do you support the construction of a new jail in Prescott, Maine? If the majority of voters say yes to that, then we can move on and, and have it in, in Prescott. Yeah, county vote or a Holton vote? County vote. Oh, whole yeah. county. Yep, whole county. We pay taxes. They pay real estate taxes. Who? The jail. No, we don't pay taxes. So why would a town want it? The workforce. You know, I mean, not just the <coughs> workforce, but like, <coughs> just think about it. We have to buy products. For, okay. We, we buy a lot from businesses right in Colton because they're there, yeah. you know. Um, and then the guards buy their food at the restaurant. The, bar, the guards yeah. buy their food at the restaurant. <laughs> McDonald's. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, 
I, I, I don't see Holton wanting to give it up, and um, I do think that at least Prescott, maybe others will make a push for it to be in their town. Uh, but our goal is to be open and transparent with this process. We're not going to hide anything. We're just going to put it all out there and let the people decide the pros and the cons of the locations and the cost and everything. Ultimately, it's not, you know, counties don't have the ability to borrow that kind of money without voter approval. So it's going to come down to the citizens of the county making the decision whether it's worth investing that kind of money. Well, um, communities really want a jail in their area. What's that? Not all communities no. are going to want a jail. No. Because you know, it brings uh, a riffraff. Yeah. 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 They had that issue with Loring at some point. They, weren't they considering one? I, I think Loring was considered for something like maybe a federal holding place yeah. or something like that. Yeah. But you're right. There's, there, it's not a winning uh, proposition to go in and say, hey, we're going to put a jail here. People <laughs> to be next to the inmates. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I probably felt that way myself at one time, but after doing this long enough, you know, once a person is in jail, they become a very different person than they were outside of jail, right? They're no longer, for the most part, they're no longer using, and, and they are sober, and they are, you know. <laughs> I remember my very first uh, time going there, it was with, Crandall was the sheriff, and he's walking me through, and he says, I'm gonna bring you inside one of the dorms. I was a little sketched out. Right? So we walk in, and there's just a bunch of guys there in their orange jumpsuits, and, they're not really paying attention to me. They're, there's this old guy in there, and I came to find out later that he was, uh, he has spent a lot of time incarcerated uh, doing stupid things. So he'll get sentenced for, you know, a couple months, and then he'll get that sentence done, he'll go out, and he'll steal a car, he'll, you know, whatever. No, but anyway, he comes up to us as we're talking, and he puts his arm around Daryl, the sheriff. Yep, me and Daryl, we started here just about the same time. <laughs> Daryl says, yeah, that's true. I've been chasing your pot plants for 30 years. <laughs> yep, uh, the story was that what they told me afterwards was for a while, Daryl had had this idea of uh, putting a garden outside so the inmates would grow vegetables. Um, that worked pretty good until one of them got some, some marijuana plants and <laughs> some marijuana plants growing in this garden outside the jail. <laughs> we don't have a garden anymore. I think today, now that it's all legal, and I guess it would yeah, yeah, probably be okay. Yeah, but that was before. Time. That was before. Uh, some of the requirements that we are going to need to look at is obviously the acreage. We're going to need a facility big enough, uh, an area big enough to handle that kind of uh, facility. We're going to want some basic municipal services like town water and sewer and like I mentioned maybe not right at an airport but close to an airport so that the transportation thing isn't too bad if we do go into that federal <coughs> prisoner program um, and while it's not required a central location would be considered but it will depend on other factors such as a regional jail authority like sharing with another county there is one well there's one jail two counties that share a jail. That's why we only have 15 jails in Maine. Uh, Saginaw Hawk and Lincoln created a, a jail authority, and that jail authority built Two Bridges Jail, which is a fairly newer facility also, um, and they share one. But the proximity between Knox and Lincoln is yeah. a little different than Aristic and uh, Do they need to be sprinkled? Yeah, new, new facility. The new code oh, is... Yeah, yeah. Any, any public building today. No, there is. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is probably another thing that's probably going to be uh, controversial for some, uh, but it certainly isn't to me and to the sheriff. Uh, we both feel real strong about this. Obviously, it'll come down to the cost of adding this into the jail. It might, it might be that what breaks it. But what we'd really like to see is a mental health and an opioid uh, clinic wings, if you will, inside or at the jail facility. So before that inmate is released back out into the public, they have they are required to go through treatment of whatever they have. Um, that happens. It's supposed to happen today, where once they get released, they're supposed to go to an opioid thing. But let's face it, a lot of them slip back uh, because they're not they're not getting away from 
what, what it was that was causing their situation to begin with. They get back with their same friends, or and it's not it's not that easy when you get out of jail to find a place like that. Right, right. There's very few places like that. Yeah. Now, a lot of the ones that you're seeing now are being really started and supported by recovered addicts who are pooling their resources and building these sober houses and whatever with very little government support. So we want we we feel it would make sense to have it inside the jail. If 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 that doesn't change, then you might as well ask for a three hundred. Yeah, right. You know, it's just going to get worse. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is getting off the jail a little bit, but I just want to highlight it. I don't know if you saw it in the paper. There was an article that came out about uh, we are participating in this national opioid settlement. Um, we're, we, I think we have like seven agreements now signed up. Maine, Maine entered a class action lawsuit mm -hmm. like they sometimes do, like when the tobacco settlement mm -hmm. fund with, I don't know, 34 other states. Uh, it's, and, and now these funds are coming into Maine and they chose counties as the place to receive the, the, the funds for that portion of it, the state's going to receive a lot more than the counties will. Uh, but our little county, over the next 15 years, is going to be receiving about two and a half million dollars from that settlement. We've already a started. Year? Huh? A year? No, total. Oh, total. Total. Oh. total. So we've already received, I think about, I think about 380,000. Um, we're supposed to get another infusion in July, and then some of them are multi-year agreements, like. 15 years or seven years or 10 years or whatever. But over the entire course of that, it's about two and a half million. We haven't started um, spending any of that money. We're basically kept it segregated from our county funds and we're waiting to see what the state puts out with their funds. So they've created a main opioid task force that's headed up by the Attorney General's office and they've started meeting themselves. And I anticipate what they're gonna do is come up with a plan that will ask the counties to be part of that some way, somehow. Um, so, and like I said, medical assisted treatment is now offered in every county jail uh, with the support of the main office of opioid response. So in addition to the money that we receive to operate the jail, this isn't guaranteed forever, but for right now, the state is providing each jail about $75,000 a year to provide that medical assisted treatment by the Suboxone or whatever, but also uh, to offset some of the costs of administering it through the jail contract, the medical contract. If you want to read up on any of this stuff, that's the website right there. Uh, just you can Google Maine Attorney General Opioids and it'll probably bring you right there. But there's a whole dedicated website on the Attorney General's office that talks about the treatment, uh, the, the, uh, the opioid settlement in the entire state. <clears throat> if you're pre if you've been found not guilty for uh, a crime because of your insane or whatever, uh, unable to be convicted, you then you get sent to Augusta as opposed to the Fed. Um. So I don't know if we've ever had that kind of situation in Aroostook County where they're they're found to be like insane is what you're saying they would be probably sentenced to Riverview which is the psychiatric uh, oh, gosh, Augusta um, I can tell you our experience with a situation was we had someone who committed a crime I can't remember what the crime was they're in Holton and clearly they have a mental health disorder that we're not capable of handling uh, very suicidal um, very just insane and so we could not get them into Riverview because of lack of bed space so we had to wait I want to say six weeks before we could get them in that entire six weeks period that one individual was for the most part of the day in a straitjacket and for the most part uh, for 24 hours a day was under constant watch by a guard so we racked up about, mm -hmm. I want to say, like $40,000 in that six-week period just in overtime costs. In 
until we finally got, we did get a doctor to finally come up to Holton from Riverview, who, you know, did his analysis and said, yeah, this guy's crazy, he needs to be in Riverview. <laughs> but we don't have a place for him. So I had to wait for a bed to open up to get him in. So that's been our experience with that type of situation. It doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's... So uh, until they, they uh, find a solution for people with mental health issues and drug addiction, the crime is just going to keep... I think so. Going up? I don't see it, I don't see it slowing down, for sure. No. And now they're starting to legalize drugs. Yeah. And, I mean, they say it's good revenue, taxes, whatever there. Mm -hmm. But then when the towns start <coughs> running out, or whoever's collecting that, yeah. the runs state. out with the state, yeah. runs out of, still doesn't have enough of what's going to be legalized next. Yeah. yeah, you're right. There's definitely going to be more okay. movement for that. Yeah. Uh, there's already some states that start legalizing, I never say this word right, but... It's basically modern-day LSD, is what it is. Oh, yeah, wow. psycho... What's it? Psycho... Yeah. Psych... Uh, Psychotropic? Well, it, it has a something... Something Halluc psych... And it's hallucinogenic, and I heard yeah. something about that. Take a that. small dose, and you go into some state of whatever euphoria, and then it's supposed to clear your mind. I don't know. I don't understand it all. But, um, but there are... I think there's a state out west. I think it's Colorado. I don't know. Sure. Has, has legalized... Or decriminalized it, anyway. So you can possess it, and... You're not going to be arrested if you're caught with it. And there was a bill in the main legislature last session to, to do the same thing here. Oh, I don't think it went really? anywhere. Really? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> there's, oh. a good, there's a good Netflix documentary on it. Oh. <laughs> I wish I could think of it. It's pretty interesting to watch and hear the advocates of this talk about all of the medicinal benefits of it. it scares me quite a bit. But, uh, yeah, you know, for forever and ever and ever, People have tried to smoke all kinds of things, right? So, I mean, Ryan, yeah. Where does education start with this in the schools? Where does it start to say that? Is it? Uh, you're I'm outside. You're out, I'm not in my comfort zone. We're talking education, okay? Bit, <laughs> education wise, is it, is it taught to the kids like it's fifth, sixth grade? And they are shown some of these dangerous things that are happening. Is yeah. It, that's but when I was a kid, and when your daughter was a yeah. kid, and your daughter was a kid, and your daughter was a kid, I went to school with all of them. Yeah. <laughs> when we were kids, we had the D.A.R.E. program mm, in schools, right? That's right. If you've seen the D.A.R.E. program, like yeah. I mean, there's very few towns, police departments, have the resources to put a full-time uh, officer in the schools. That's, and the D.A.R.E. program was a, fu you know, a funded program from another place where the local PD would get money, and that person would be the D.A.R.E. officer. A lot more education was happening in the schools then than today. So it's like we're doing things just counterintuitive yeah, yeah. to the situation that it's we're in. Will it, would it make a big difference? I don't know, but the program's not really in existence anymore. Is that a law officer, a police officer in the high school? I don't think so, because Jamie Pelletier was the last yeah. one, the school resource officer, and he's now the acting chief, and I assume he's going to be the chief. Uh, so I don't think they have a, a, a resource officer in the school anymore. We would do it. And the county would probably do that at some point, um, but it would it would end up being again a cost decision. You know, do we want to put one in every school in Arista County, or maybe have three in Arista County, one in the north, one in central, one in south? Um, but it's going to take more than look. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The education has to start at home. Yes. That's where it has to start. Yep. So when we can fix society problems, Absolutely. then we'll be better off. But it's, you know. Mom and dad are on the Well, that, you know, yes. that's, <laughs> that's that right. unfortunately is a lot of what has happened. It's, yeah. you know, yep. it's, um, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids, you know, maybe mom and dad are on whatever, or there is no dad or whatever, yeah, but, that's right. but, um, they're being raised as best they can by a grandparent or, you know, yep. it's, it's really a sad, sad state. I don't, I don't know. I've kind of lived it, right? I've seen it. I remember the county that I grew up in, and it's not the county we live no. in today. <laughs> That's right. You know, I remember, I remember uh, years back when you'd hear about these things, you'd say, well, that's, that's Southern Maine's problem. Yeah. That's not our problem. We don't have that up here. 
And then it was all that, you know, drugs, that's a bad thing in Washington County. You know, but we don't have that. And then all of a sudden it was in Holton. Well, it's a southern rustic problem, but we don't have it in the valley. Yeah. Well, guess well, what? Well, guess what? It's, here. it's everything. It's all over. It's all over. Uh, Ryan? Yep. Yeah. The, uh, the sitting in prison for a year and a half to get a court date. Yeah. Is that across the nation? Uh, I'm more familiar with Maine, um, and I would say it's certainly common in Maine. It's not it's not unique to Arista County, that's for sure. Uh, I think it. I, th I think you're going to find it a lot more though in the rural parts of the co the country, where there aren't the numbers of, like we said, you know, lawyers. Um, and Maine has to do a better job of increasing that indigent fee. I mean, it's just. Mm. I think it's terrible because I say somebody's in jail for two years. They go to court and they're not guilty. Well, that what rarely that rarely that yeah yeah that rarely happens though. But but you're right. I mean, can uh, they sue if they sit in jail longer than two years and then they're found not guilty? No, I, no, I don't. I mean, I guess my answer would be anybody can sue anybody for anything. Right? Yeah. So I guess they could. Now, will they prevail? I don't That's know. Um, <laughs> but. You know, I make this. I make it sound probably a little worse than it is. The ones that are sitting in jail for two plus years are the ones that are, you know, accused of murder, and most likely are going to be found guilty. I don't. I don't remember in recent time anybody in Arista County being charged with murder that didn't get convicted of murder. In some cases, uh, I read on the news and stuff like these guys in the jail for like 30, 40 years, and now with DNA. Yep. That, so, you know, they were yeah, for sure. They were guilty. Yeah. yeah. That, Imagine that for years. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That happened. And those people, I think, do get compensated. Oh, yeah. I should hope so. Yeah. But, you know, it's 70, 80, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you keep track of, uh, let's say, statistics the last 10 years on the age of of the participants? That the, uh, it starts at 18, yeah. but Joe, Joe V now, they used to send them to Hinkley, but now I don't know what they send them down for. The Juvies? Yeah. That most of them are in uh, Long Creek, which is in mm -hmm. South Portland. Oh, okay. And they're, bit, they're busting from the scene. Yeah. About a few years ago. Yeah. But uh, do you see a pattern that crimes are, uh, bigger car crimes are, are done by younger uh, yeah you know. I mean I mean I wouldn't I would say you know the crime most most crimes are not committed by senior citizens yeah. uh, maybe a few <laughs> but not not the majority most, We're of, all good. most of it is you know uh, <laughs> really once you get into the honestly once you get into the 50 50s range you're not seeing many crimes being by people in our jail yeah. It's mostly 20 and 30 and some 40-year-olds. Mm -hmm. And, the, the, you know, I, I say it's all drug-related, but it really, the crime the crime that we see the most of, you know, yeah, you'll occasionally have a drug bust and you'll have the, the person being actually arrested for the drugs. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the crime that we see in a rustic is domestic violence more than anything. Wow. And, and it's... It's oftentimes drug connected or drug related, yeah. you know, but that's what they're being charged with is, the, is domestic violence. Not always like, you know, the typical boyfriend, husband, whatever beats the wife type thing, but just threatening, you know. Just in my town where I live in St. Agatha yesterday, sheriff's office, sheriff's deputies fly through and that's why <laughs> people are, you know, on Facebook asking what's going on and nobody knows where they're going, whatever. Well, come to find out it was a guy with a gun who was threatening his girlfriend and there was a five-year-old in the house and he got, he did get arrested, they arrested him, they caught him and arrested him. He didn't hurt her, but he had a gun threatening to do something if she didn't do what he wanted her to do or whatever. So yeah, that, that's, that's the biggest one. Are you coming back to the senior citizen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a senior citizen discount at the jail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the, only one, the, the only one in this room that could probably run away from the cops would be Don Bear. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, Look at the radar. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll answer any questions you have, but I, just in closing, I, I do want to kind of ask you all to think about can, 
being an advocate for a new jail when it does come time, um, there is going to be uh, there is going to be a lot of uh, pressure, I think, uh, at that time, and it would be good to have as many people on our side as possible. Uh, like I said the the business, if you will, of incarceration isn't glamorous. Um, we're not, you know, we're not looking to build a Taj Mahal because we want a shiny new jail. It's really because of out of necessity more than anything, and it's about your public safety and public safety of our region. And, you know, if that adding a treatment center in the jail is a little bit more, I think mm -hmm. it's well worth the investment. So I'm not going to stop advocating for that. I might get shut down at some point <laughs> by, uh, by higher ups than me, but um, we do feel that it would pay itself off over time. Ryan? Yeah? Would you be against giving us a coffee as well? No, you have you have it, Don. Can you get that to them? Oh, the, thank you so we'll get it. Yeah, yeah. That, that, you got to wait. Uh, my contact info, if you ever need to reach me, mm. that's my number and that's my email. And Sheriff Ewan. What's your address? One forty four <laughs> Sweden Street, Caribou, Maine. One four seven three six. So can you? Huh? You can you from Caribou down? Uh, I, I live in St. Agad. Oh, you, you still live in St. Agad? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, they'll not get me off the lake, that's for sure. Um, and I travel from there to Caribou every day. I don't. The Holton is where I would say the majority of county government is because of the sheriff's office and some of the other services. But um, the county commissioner's office is in Caribou. Oh. Is it at the courthouse? Yeah. No. Oh. We're in the basement of the courthouse. Been there since I think the mid 80s is when they moved the commissioner's office from, some of you probably, I don't know if you remember Keith Lambert? Yeah. yeah. Keith was the county commissioner from this area before Norm. Oh. And he and um, Dave Bell, who was the county commissioner in Caribou, teamed up against the guy from Holton and said, we're no longer gonna have an office in the southern part of the county, we're moving it to Central, so we're all in the middle. And uh, that's how it came to be. And so the compromise was, because it was technically legal to do that because they weren't building a new building, they were just moving the office, right? So they, they moved the office to Caribou and they um, came to an agreement that the commissioner's meetings themselves would rotate. So even though the main office is there, every, you know, every, we have a meeting every month and they rotate between Fort Kent, Caribou, and both. And those are public meetings, you can come and watch the proceedings at any time if you're really bored <laughs> and want to learn about county government. We also are on Zoom, every meeting's on Zoom, we post our agenda and all of that on our website. So. Is there any way you can get me on a list for jury duty? Do you want to be on jury duty? Oh, I would love to be on jury duty. You've never been picked? I've never been picked. Neither. I, got I would like to ask you I'll tell you, I, I'll ask, I'll ask if there's a way a person can be put on. Uh, people try to get away from it all the time, all the time people try to get away from it. Me too, I would like that. I, I served one time, I, I probably wouldn't be allowed to now because of what I do, but I, I did, I, I did get picked, well, picked to go. And I never had to, they, they settled the cases or my face didn't look like, because what they do is they bring in a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. and then they lottery that, they actually have a drum and then they narrow that down and then that becomes what the, the defense gets to pick and the prosecutor gets to pick and it's back and forth. Yeah, yeah. I never got picked, so I don't know, I guess I... I, I prefer a murder trial. Well, regular jury trials are probably not as glamorous as, as others, but um, something that I think would be interesting is to be picked for grand jury. So grand jury is different. Well, yeah, grand jury, what happens is there's no defense at grand jury. It's the DA presenting all the evidence as to why this person should be indicted. Indictment. Indictment. Oh. Yeah. So you get to see all of the, all of the story, the the reasons why laid out in front of you, and you, the grand jury, decides if there's enough evidence to bring somebody to to trial mm -hmm. or to yeah, indict them. I was in there for a year, uh, Holton. Yeah, so it's a whole year process, Carol, right? You got to yeah. do it once a month. Yeah, for each. Well, in that oh. time, one month, I went one day in Holton, one day in Prescott. Uh, sure. You know what I mean? But I never seen one case not being indicted. Not being indicted. Yeah. We did like forty every time we went it was all indicted because 
We're not saying you're guilty. No. Uh, the DA comes in, like we, you say, but he says it's a nice story, yeah. so, okay, there must be... Yeah, must be <laughs> reason the there. cop comes in, he does his yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's interesting because you hear... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's um, not just that one case. Yeah. I, I, I've watched enough uh, Law and Order. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to be there with a gown. Are you one of those that thinks that a case should be solved in you know one hour? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, no. Doesn't work that way. No. Uh, any other questions? Thank you so much. Anytime. So what are we going to talk about next? We did the county overview. We did jails. You want me to do? I can't do registry of deeds. That's too boring for me. You'd have to get okay. someone else to that. Don't we, we didn't think of this one. Uh, we're going to have well, a mock trial. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this class. Yeah, that was uh, great. Yes. I enjoyed it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I enjoyed it. And, and yeah. we should probably say that there's, there are now two more classes, uh, senior college classes coming up. One is in June. Uh, and then to Taxpayers Advocate Services. And then the next one comes out in August. And, uh, and it's, a, it's in the middle of August, so, uh, and that's the uh, Micmac, um, I never get the word right. Here we are. Say it in English. That's English. Okay. <laughs> but it's kind of a powwow type of thing, and uh, anyway. Um, but I, I think tonight, certainly, uh, I think all of us, I think, were really uh, uh, made aware, I think, of, of, of really, the, the, what is a jail? And, uh, and I guess what I appreciated the most out of this is um, the attitude, I mean, your, your willingness to look at preventive, preventing people from being there, you know, if, if it's yeah. mm -hmm. directly related to drugs, to look for services, right. yep. you know, and... Um, yeah, because if we don't do it, nobody else will. Right. That's <laughs> no, <laughs> and it's true, but that's, that's the way to, to yeah. kind of crack this whole issue. Okay. But anyway, but uh, okay. thank you again. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.